So folks, welcome back. Well, today I'm going to try a little bit more of a longer format. I know YouTube and the algorithms that YouTube has probably aren't going to like that. We'll see. But what YouTube really wants you to do is create these little five, 10 minute segments. You create a thumbnail, you put your keywords in and all this kind of stuff. And it really is a pain in the ass, to be honest with you. Um, and I'd much rather do a longer format. So I've got a really good podcast audience and I think they would enjoy that more. I've got a really good YouTube audience and I think more than likely they would enjoy that just as just the same. So that's the direction that I'm going in. And today, folks, I just want to talk a little bit about Charlie Kirk before I get into some of the other topics. And we've got the House impeachment inquiry that's going on. We've got uh, the Trump properties, which ones are, are possibly going to be on the auction block. Uh, we've got cabinet picks. You know, Trump is starting to come up with some cabinet picks. And then we've got Jared Kushner, the little turd that he is, just wife, riding this wave of grift of the Trump family and something that he said that I want to bring to your attention. But first off, let's talk about Charlie Kirk and this, this notion that if you're a Christian, you really can only vote Republican, you know, is what he's trying to push here. And I think that's re absolutely ass backward ridiculous. Um, since when does he own the rights to Christianity, folks? I mean, really, think of it like that. Since when does Charlie Kirk own the rights to Christianity? And the thing about it is the this whole walling off of religion, it's a weaponization, really, when you get down to it. They're weaponizing Christianity as we know it by saying that you you really have to vote Republican. You know, it's it's using that religion to twist you around their little screw. And they're tightening the screws down on on people that call themselves Democrats and Christians. And it's it's ridiculous. Here's what he said, folks. Have a listen. To answer your question, no. If you vote Democrat as a Christian, I think you can you can no longer call yourself a Christian. You have to call yourself something else. I do not think you could be a Christian and vote Democrat. Thank you for the answer. You know, he's such a little toad. No. If you call yourself a Christian, you cannot vote Democrat. You have to call yourself something else. Well, I would suggest that you call yourself a smart, intelligent Christian because you, you can see through what he's trying to do in the weaponization of religion. And, you know, how many people do you think are going to fall for that? That that crazy notion. And it, and it just feeds into the whole divisive nature of Republicans and Democrats. And, you know, the weaponization of religion, I think, is, is something that... If he believes in the Almighty Creator, it's something that he's going to be held accountable for. I really do. I think these people, they just say crap like this. And in their own religion, there will be accountability, right? In the Christian religion, there'll, there will be accountability. And he will have to answer, <clears throat> if he believes in his religion, he will have to answer to things like this that he's doing. Um to the almighty folks. I mean, it's, it, it's absolutely uh, mind boggling to me, the direction that we seem to be going. We seem to be getting just more and more divided as we continue. And it doesn't have to be that way. It really doesn't. We don't have to make religion something as divisive as they want it to be. So today we've got this house impeachment inquiry that's going on uh, today. They're, they're trying to ultimately impeach Joe Biden. And have a listen to this. So Newsmax, one of the hosts on Newsmax, said to Jim Jordan, you appear to be chasing your tail on this whole impeachment inquiry thing. Have a listen. Uh, is impeachment the next step? Are you going to hold a vote on the House floor? I know it's up to Mike Johnson, but the margins, Congressman, you lost Kevin McCarthy. Ken Buck left last week. George Santos was ousted. Unless you get Democratic votes, this is going to be real tough. So it, it, it kind of seems like you're chasing your tail at this point because this is not going well, to go anywhere. No, fair question. And we got a, you know, we got a small majority. Everyone understands that, not just on this issue, but on a host of issues. Our job is under the Constitution is to do oversight of the executive branch. We are doing that. We're going to continue to do that. There's no time limit in the Constitution on how long you can do an investigation. Our uh, is it you know, so this whole thing, did you hear him say that there's no time limit? I mean, this is this is just spinning your wheels here, folks. We've got issues like funding Ukraine. We've got the border to consider. 
And all they're doing is chasing their tail on this, this whole thing with with Biden. Plus, at the end of the day, they really don't have the margin that they need to push this thing through. It's just a, it, it's just such a, a colossal waste of time. And why are Republicans doing this? I mean, aren't there better ways? Aren't there more things that we should be doing for Americans than sitting here and spinning our wheels on an impeachment inquiry? And just to show you how frivolous this is, have a listen to this. So this is Fox News' Maria Bartiromo, who's got a voice that just, you know, echoes through the the Capitol, and Jim Jordan is standing there in the Capitol, and you can just hear it echoing. You know, she's got that voice that just penetrates concrete. Have a listen to this. How much money have you been able to identify that has gone directly to Joe Biden? Because I know your colleagues, uh, James Comer, the chairman of Oversight, has told me that you, you've identified $30 million from foreign characters all over the world yeah. that have sent money to the Biden clan. But I'm trying to understand how much Joe Biden actually got of that, if in fact he got yeah. any of it. Well, th- there's there's the, the loan payments, there's the 200000 there's the four, uh, $40,000 that, that we we can show. They say it's a loan payment, even though there's no documents for it. This, this is all stuff that the Oversight Committee has uncovered. Uh, I mean, th- this is part of the, the, <laughs> the whole strategy here, moving money around. You know, it's a family loan. Do you have to have documents? I mean, what, what does he expect? I mean, is, should there be something recorded at the county level, you know, for a family loan? Jim Jordan, I mean, how far are we going to take this? I mean, what what kind of documents are you looking for? There's no documents. What the hell are you looking for? Um, folks, it's just, it's ridiculous. It's just a, uh, it's just a, it's just a cheap hit against Joe Biden. They're trying to do anything that they can to drag him down, folks. Just a colossal, like I said, colossal waste of time. But let's take a look at this. So what are the Trump properties that are going to be coming up on the auction block? What's on the block here? Let's take a look. So in this article, folks, we've got, um, you know, the amount is $464 million that Donald Trump is going to have to come up with. And this was ordered by Judge Arthur Engeron to pay, for him to pay the fine in a judgment that uh, said that he inflated the value of his assets and properties on financial statements to banks and all this kind of stuff. So $464 million, and that keeps going up with interest, folks. I think it's up to, you know, just under half a billion now. So what are the properties that are going to be coming up on the block? I mean, there's a whole list of them here, and she can actually start doing, you know, putting liens on these properties, and then she can actually, once the lien is filed, then she can process to get the the title changed into her name. I mean, this is pretty serious stuff. And in there, you've got the the Shining Gem Mar-a-Lago in Palm Beach. I mean, you've got the Shining Gem of the Trump Empire that could be changing hands. Um, of course, Donald Trump criticized the judgment handed down by Angron and said he may have to sell some of his properties to come up with the bond amount, but he's not going to sell Mar-a-Lago, if he can get away with it, right? I mean, he's got Trump Park Avenue, Trump Tower, 40 Wall Street, 7 Springs, Trump International Hotel and Tower, the golf clubs, you know, the golf clubs. Good luck with that one in Florida, Um, you know, down in Miami, I guess. What is that, the Doral? I don't even see that on the list here. But he's got all these golf clubs that he can sell. And, you know, let's see what they go for. You know, let's, let's put these things on the block and see... See if they're worth as much as he thinks it is, especially Mar-a-Lago. You know, he said the valuation is far too low, and he's just blabbed on about, you know, how overinflated his properties are to the point where, well, obviously you could sell Mar-a-Lago and you could cover that bond because he says it's worth so much more than $18 million. Well, let's let's put it on the block and see. I'd, I'd love to see Mar-a-Lago go back to a private individual, and I'm sure that people that live around Mar-a-Lago would like to see it go back to a private individual as well, given the noise, the traffic, and all of the other BS that goes along with it. So, folks, today, remember Vivek Ramaswamy, that sycophant that was always out there, and it was so icky sweet the way he talked about Trump. Icky, you know, sugary sweet. And back then I always said, you know, this guy is just gunning for gunning for some sort of office in the Trump administration. Well, it looks like, yeah, that's that's actually ex- exactly what was going on. So the, the question here is, what is the role that he's going to play 
in the Trump administration. God forbid if Trump does get reelected. So according to this article by The Guardian, Bloomberg News cited people briefed in the discussion and reporting that Trump personally told Ramaswamy he won't be his vice presidential pick. Oh, too bad. But is considering him for post including Homeland Security Secretary. And which I think is a joke. You know, they say here that, you know, he's this Ramaswamy is the son of immigrants from India, which might help neutralize the criticism of hardline immigration measures. But he's also said that he's promised to put migrants in camps and institute mass deportations. Um, Trump has said that migrants are poisoning the blood of our country. So I don't think that the background that Ramaswamy has is going to matter very much at all. I mean, it might seem like he's well-suited, right? The son of immigrants from India. But when Trump says he wants to put migrants in camps and split up families, institute mass deportations, um, and I think... Ramaswamy himself has said that he wants all of the the DACA kids that are over here. He wants to send them back too. And these kids have got families, houses, livelihoods, all this kind of stuff. So here's the man that's going to be putting migrants in camps and mass deportations, poisoning, uh, sending these people back that supposedly are poisoning the blood of our country, uh, something that Adolf Hitler more than likely would have said, or at least given him the thumbs, thumbs up for. So that's what they're considering or Vivek Ramaswamy, what, what about everybody else? Well, they're thinking that Elise Stefanik of New York, which is just a, you know, a, a real garish loudmouth herself, the number three U.S. House Republican, she's dropped off the vice presidential list, but is in line for a cabinet post should Trump defeat Joe Biden. So the other cabinet picks that he's got here is Bloomberg is named Doug Burgum, North Carolina, or the North Dakota governor, who ran for the Republican nomination, Robert Lighthizer, U.S. Trade Representative. Um, they'll be on the list. Kevin McCarthy was a top candidate, evidently, for chief of staff. You know, of course, of course. And then you've got two far-right senators, Mike Lee of Utah and Ted Cruz of Texas, one of my all-time favorites, are reportedly seen as a possible pick for attorney general. Could there be any other person that could be worse for attorney general than Ted Cruz. Um, you know, maybe that sleepy eyed attorney general or, uh, what's his name? Ken Paxton down in Texas. I mean, can you imagine somebody like that becoming attorney general? And I'm sure he'd love to love that naturally. And then you've got Tim Scott, the South Carolina Senator who ran for the nomination, but switched to declaring his love for Trump has reportedly been pushed as a vice presidential pick by allies, including Lindsey Graham and John Thune. So you've got that going on. And then um, Trump sounded less than enthusiastic about Scott when talking to Sean Hannity last month. He said Tim for himself was fine. He did okay. I mean, he was okay as a candidate, but he didn't want to talk about himself. He's a very good man. For me, he's unbelievable. He's a surrogate. So... I guess Trump sees him as a surrogate and not somebody that he wants necessarily in the cabinet. So, you know, folks, we got to talk about Jared Kushner just here at the tail end of this. So here's a guy that is as privileged as they come writing the grift of the family name of Trump. And you won't believe what he's saying about the Gaza Strip. And I, I just think it's absolutely ridiculous and, and it just kind of shows that there's not there's not really a lot of depth when you get to their concern about people or their empathy. There, there's no empathy. That's that's what I wanted to say. There, the empathy is totally lacking. They, they cannot empathize. Trump cannot empathize. You know, he said on school shootings, well, you just have to get over it. You have to get over it. You have to get over it. There's just not one shred of empathy. It's almost as if being empathetic about somebody in their condition is a liability, right? Uh, there's just no empathy. And I think you'll see that come out in this clip that I've got. Have a listen to this, folks. Both guys are spending a fortune on military. I think neither side uh, really wants to have, you know, a terrorist organization enclaved right between them. I mean, Gaza's waterfront property, it could be uh, very valuable to uh, if people would focus on kind of building up 
um, you know, livelihoods. You think about all the money that's gone into this tunnel money, network money, and money. all the munitions, if that would have gone into education or innovation, uh, what could have been done? And so I think that um, it, it's a little bit of an unfortunate situation there, but I think from Israel's perspective, I would a do my best to move the people out and then clean it up. A little unfortunate, he said about what happened to the people there. Move them out and clean it up. All they see are dollar signs, folks. All they see are dollar signs. I mean, it's people like this that need to be throttled back. I mean, if there was ever anyone who should not be serving in a public capacity, uh, it's somebody like this. And I think empathy is a quality that you need to have if you're going to be serving as president of the United States. And, and it's not a sign of weakness, folks. It really isn't. Uh, it, it's a character trait that is is something that we should aspire to. And this man, he's got no empathy. It's all about money, money, money. Move him out. Let's put up some condos. God knows what else, you know. Uh, let's move him out to some other place. You know, where? Who cares, right? Who cares? Just move them all out. I mean, they've already been displaced, I think is his point. So let's just get in there with the dozers. Let's just clean it up and put some towers in there, some pools. And let's just sit back, have a glass of wine, and enjoy the view. Till next time, folks.